Welcome to the Stewardship Leader Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Stewardship Network. CSN exists to encourage, teach, and connect church and stewardship leaders to help them create and lead healthy stewardship ministries in their church. You can learn more about CSN at christianstewardshipnetwork.com. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to Stewardship Leader. I'm your host, Leo Sabo. And today I have with me Amber George. She is the Director of Kingdom Living. Love that title. But she's also the Operations Pastor at Crossroads Church in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Amber, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. This is an exciting opportunity. I appreciate it. Of course, of course. We are uh, so appreciative of you. I had a chance to speak with you and your husband, who's also on staff, Stephen, is on staff as executive pastor at Crossroads. And I had a chance to really communicate with both of you over several conversations and discussions that we had. And I was so impressed with both of you, just your passion for ministry. And I wanted you to come on and share that story of how did you end up at Crossroads? How did you end up talking about stewardship? How did What's the story behind that? I'd love to hear that. And so let's start with what is your personal stewardship story? Uh, would you share that with our audience today? Yeah, absolutely. So I think our story starts the same way most people starts with tithing, right? So we were attending Crossroads and um, I'm a rule follower by nature. So when you tell me you're supposed to give 10%, had nothing to do with heart at the time. It was 100%. I'm supposed to do this, so I'll do it. Um, and so we gave our 10% and, um, and that's where it started. But then we were in a stewardship series and our pastor shared a video, a uh, personal testimony video from Rick Warren from Saddleback Church. And in the video, he talked about stewardship and just how his $5 Walmart watch told the same time as a Rolex watch. And uh, at the end, he left with a challenge. And that was, he told a story about how he and Kay made an agreement that they were going to give God a, um, in addition to their 10%, they were going to give God an increase every single year, give God a raise. Mm. And so they started every single year, they would increase their giving by a certain percentage based off how that year had gone. Um, And even on bad years, they would always increase it. Even if it was just like 0.5%, they would increase it. And that was something that really just struck a chord in us. We were like, well, God says to test him, like, like, what's the worst that could happen? Let's try this. And that was really our first to like step in the water, do something different uh, above and beyond. And so we started doing that and um, have continued doing that throughout the rest of the time there. So that was probably about eight years ago that we started doing that. Hmm. And um, in that, I think that's where God really started to work on our hearts because we were giving to something bigger than ourselves. And so um, in that time, you know, we made some good financial decisions. We made some really bad financial decisions as uh, young couples starting out, wanting the house, wanting the car, wanting the things. But through all of that, through all the transitions, through job changes and everything, God was, I mean, always came through, which for us was just we were always really aware that God was always there. He was always providing for us, no matter what a hard time we were going through financially, he was always there. And so, um, you know, so fast forward, we were uh, invited to a financial leaders dinner in 2018 and we got the ear of our pastor and we were just sitting there finishing up dinner. And we had noticed that at, um, A couple months prior, our church does a 21 days of prayer and they lay out all the prayer requests on the stage. And so we were, we took our kids and we were picking them up and we were praying over as a family over these prayer requests. And it hit us that every single prayer request had something to do with financial freedom, Mm -hmm. whether it was debt, whether it was a career decision, whether it was something, everything, every single card had something to do with financial freedom. And that really hit us and kind of was one of those seeds that God planted that started to turn in our hearts. Mm -hmm. And then we went to this financial leaders dinner, we get the ear of the pastor and we asked them, we said, you know, um, you just stood there, you talked to us about the future of our church and wanting to grow people and grow disciples. And this is a problem we're seeing. How do we fix it? Like, what are we doing to help people? 
being from a small church, a uh, small to medium sized church at that time, our, this was pre COVID. So our church was about 400, 500 people. Mm -hmm. um, and our pastors looked at us and they said, that is a great question. What do we do about it? <laughs> <laughs> Which is very much that small church. Yes, like is. there's only so many people who can um, do so many things. And so we were like, oh, uh, I guess we figure out what we do about this. And so they fully um, empowered us and said, I don't know, you guys present something, figure it out, help us figure out how we fix this problem. And so that was in December of 2018. And then in January of 2019, uh, one of our lead pastors uh, started his sabbatical. And so the co-lead pastor, um, you know, she was kind of interested in what we could do. And I started Googling just, you know, you don't know what to do. You Google it. So I was Googling um, at the time. I think I even just Googled Christian tithing and giving because I didn't even know this stewardship, like the word stewardship or this idea of it. So a couple pages in all of a sudden CSN's website pops up. I'm like, what is this? Like, never heard of this before. So click on it. And lo and behold, in about 20 days, there was a um, stewardship impact workshop in the forum. So I read it and I'm like, I don't know. So at the time I called Trish Crossley, who was uh, the ministry assistant at the time. Yep. I'm like, we're trying to start a ministry. Is this the right, are you guys the right people to talk to? Is this who we should, you know, is your forum worth the money that we would be bringing to, to, do, to go? Yep. And she was like, absolutely. This is like where you start. And so we presented it to the lead pastor at the time. And she was, she was just like, you know, let's do it. And let's all three go. And let's, if we're really going to do this, let's go all in. And so we were able to, uh, you know, a benefit of a small church is your lead pastor is, you know, the next level up. So we were able to have her join us. And my husband and I at the time as volunteers went to the stewardship impact workshop and to the, uh, forum for the first time in 2019. And, uh, it was life-changing. I mean, completely life-changing for us. Um, even our lead pastor, she was just blown away. It, it made her think about stewardship in a way that she had never thought about it before. It challenged her as the, as one of the people who gets an influence into a sermon series and how they're preached. Um, you know, she was very challenged by it. But then personally for me, I had always prayed for God to give me um, a burden for something. So like, what is it that your heart bleeds for that my heart can bleed for? And what is it that I can be passionate about and gung-ho about and not just filling a role, but really being passionate about it? And um, the, the night we finished the Stewardship Impact Workshop, that it was immediately clear to me, this was this is what God had given me a burden for was stewardship. I was just so on fire and um, just, it was incredible hearing from these people who were so passionate and, and getting to hear about stewardship as a whole life perspective and in a way you view everything versus just tithing. Like, I think we probably went into it thinking, how do we help people get out of debt and how do we raise more money for the church? And we walked out of it completely changed as far as how we see every aspect of life. So it was incredible because I attended a breakout session on how to start a stewardship ministry. And then the week after, uh, was able to literally pick up the phone and call. It was um, Steve Carter who did it. And I was able to pick up the phone and be like, okay no idea what I'm doing. What did you do? How did you do it? Um, and I'll never forget he, I mean, it was as if his ministry was my ministry because the amount of time and energy he put into educating me and helping me avoid some of the pitfalls that other people have run into. We spent the next year uh, creating a focus group and running small Bible study groups on stewardship and really just growing in that. And so within, it's actually kind of funny because we had, we built this uh, kingdom living, what we call kingdom living DNA. And it's a three week foundational class on how you uh, learn to steward what God has provided you in his kingdom. And we, uh, it, we created it, we were working through this and we uh, had it set to start on a Tuesday in March of um, 
2020 and we went to the 2020 uh, forum and I was still I still remember sitting on the last day and all of us saying what is COVID what is this that we're all talking about we're all getting calls on what we're doing for Sunday and are we going to show up and are we not and everyone's trying to figure out if they can get home from the forum so we get home we're supposed to start the uh, class on Tuesday and lo and behold Tuesday morning the advice is that everything shuts down and everything quarantines. And so we'd put all this a year's worth of prepping for this class to be able to set it up and we had to shut everything down. Mm. And uh, yeah, so it was crazy because it was this like, God, what are you doing? Like you got us all excited and now we're on fire and now it's done. Um, and so we uh, we had to shut it down. But during that time, um, God continued to grow us. So he gave us um opportunities. Uh, my husband and I had the opportunity to be interviewed for one of our online sermons that we were recording. We had the opportunity to speak about stewardship. Mm -hmm. And then in the fall of 2020, unfortunately, our pastors ended up getting COVID. And on a Friday night called and said, hey, Sunday sermon is about stewardship. Can you preach it? Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> I had never preached before. I'm not a, you know, I, I worked for the federal government for 15 years. I was not a uh, pastor, was not um, trained for that, had gone to ministry or anything like that. And so it was one of those times where God said, okay, I've, I've grown all this in you. I've, I've planted the seed. We're going to let this grow. And we're going to really get an opportunity to share with everybody. And so um, I had the opportunity to preach on stewardship and it really just continued to light that fire and that passion. And um, luckily that fall, we were able to go back to in-person events and we hosted uh, that class and we've continued to host that class. We had an incredible turnout. Lots of people came, which was extremely exciting because it was the, the work you put into it. You want to make sure that it, you know, it gets somewhere. And um, so we had, we've, we've been able to run that class as well as do um, financial coaching with folks and meeting with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I think as far as my personal stewardship story, it really, um, God really fast forwarded it in this last year. So as, as you had introduced me, the operations pastor. So for the last 11 years, I had actually served in a volunteer role while still mm -hmm. having a full-time job with the federal government. And, um, you know, my husband and I have been challenged as we've been growing in our stewardship. And so this last year was a question of, we've hit all these marks, we've done all these things. Now, how do we like really grow? Like, what's our next step? What's our deeper step? What can we do? And we were trying to figure out what that looked like. And God had told me, I want you to set up your finances in such a way that if you were called into ministry full time, that you could do that. And I'm like, okay. And so I told my husband about it. And I was like, Hey, I think this is what God's calling us to. And he's like, okay, you know, that's like a big change. I'm like, yeah. And, and in my head, I'm like, okay, God, I'll do it. Cause in 10 to 15 years from now, when it comes, it'll be a good time. The kids will be out of school. Like it'll be near my retirement anyway. So it'll be a great time to do it. And, um, two weeks later, uh, this entire chain of events occurs that of course, now looking back, nothing's a coincidence, but, right. um, two weeks from the time God told me to set up our finances that way, I had an opportunity in front of me to come on staff full time with our church. Our um, co-lead pastor was actually uh, chosen to become the associate national director for the Vineyard for mm -hmm. church health and development, which is an incredible opportunity, but left a hole in our staff and our church. Yep. And so um, I had this opportunity and I probably had about a week to make the decision. And I had just spent 15 years in the federal government. I was ex like, I'm a very loyal person. So I didn't jump around. Like I had been with this group I was working with for almost 10 years and um, really had to wrestle with God on that, on this one, because it was such a big step. It was a $90,000 pay decrease <laughs> wow. to, uh, to jump. Yeah. That's, and that's um, significant right there. Let's pause right. for a moment. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, that's yeah. Tough. So $90,000 and that didn't include the retirement and the insurance and mm. all the things that, um, that immediately came to mind when I had this opportunity. Uh, however, God really used this to, um, I'll, I'll never forget sitting in the car and you know driving down the road, having a conversation with God and just asking him if this was really what he wanted me to do. 
Mm. And clearly he told me, if you don't do this, it will be disobedience. Right. Like that's how clear this is. And um, really used this opportunity to grow me personally in my own um, stewardship journey, because he made it clear to me at the time that the reason I was so hesitant to move on is because well, I said that he was my God and I trusted him and he had all, you know, I surrender everything to him. I was really using my job and that money as a security, as, as the net. In case God failed, I have the security blanket that will catch right. me. Right. And so he clearly said like, you, you're passionate about stewardship. You teach people about it. You talk to people about it and you live it. But are you ready to like fully surrender to where you have to trust me for everything. You have to surrender all control and really just trust me that that daily manna, like, do you trust that I will provide day after day after day? Um, and so, uh, yeah, so after that week, I decided to, to leave that job and come on full time um, as the operations pastor here pa this past January. Um, but it's, I mean, this last year has really been his like, we're going to go deep and we're going to um, really like sur surrender it to get to that next level, um, both, you know, for me to trust him to that in that next level, but for him to also allow us uh, a new new layer of freedom in our lives. This episode of the Stewardship Leader podcast is sponsored by Vision 2 Systems. Vision 2 is the comprehensive giving solution that enables a ministry-first approach to stewardship and generosity. We engage givers with tailored giving experience and acknowledgements, elevate ministry with unparalleled efficiency for your support staff, and enable leadership with analytics and reporting tools to support your church and congregation's generosity stewardship. We're more than software though. Vision 2 is your partner, an extension of your team throughout our partnership. Reach out to us at let's talk at vision2.com to discuss ways we can serve your church and givers or visit vision2.com to learn more. Wow, I just that's so inspiring to hear your story because there's so much uh, that resonates with with me personally uh, about your story. I, I believe that at some point God will test all of us as to the genuineness of our commitment. You and Stephen made a decision to tithe. But that was because, like you said, you're a rule follower. So if that's right. what you're supposed to do, you're going to do it. My wife and I were exactly the same. My wife was not saved when we got married. I had walked away from the church early, uh, late teens, early 20s when I got married. But we had conversations about it. And I said, you know, this is important to me. I don't know where I fit in right now. Um, our church had gone through a split. So I was kind of disillusioned with the church. And and I walked away from the church, but I didn't walk away from my relationship with God. And I said, I don't know what that looks like, but I do want you to know if we're going to get married and have children, God's got to be in the center of it. I, I just don't know how to do it otherwise. Yeah. So when we got pregnant with Rachel, our firstborn, I said, okay, time to go to church. And she's like, all right. <laughs> and literally she got radically saved in the small church and our life was never the same in a good way. But tithing was one of those things. We got our membership packet when we went to this church and us assemblies of God. And one of the things it said is by agreeing to this commitment to be a member, you you agreed to support this church with your tithes and offerings. And I thought, huh, okay, yeah, that makes sense, right? I mean, right. church has bills. They have to pay the, the mortgage, yeah. whatever. And I said, okay, so we just did it. But like you, we didn't really understand it. And, and it took time for us to understand stewardship. And when we finally did, we did have to pass that test. And like you, I had to step out of a 16-year career with benefits, with the, take the pay cut, take everything else. So yeah. I just, just brought all that back as you were sharing. But it is a test that I think we need to pass. And sometimes there's multiple tests. Sometimes they're small, sometimes they're great. Uh -huh. um, but if we're going to be stepping out and teaching others, we have to first and foremost be good models. And you can't do that unless you really walk that road. Because yeah. I think people, I believe people see through someone that's truly walked that out. Mm -hmm. Because when we sit down with people one-on-one -on -one and we ask them to take some huge steps to trust God, to, to give up on things, to sacrifice things, we can't do it unless we sacrifice ourselves. We can't mm -hmm. have the compassion to do it. So I, I love how God prepared you for this season of ministry and, and just a journey that you took. Um, God knew the timing. He knew when, you know, giving you the opportunity to preach, which probably led to a lot of people coming to that class when you finally did launch it. 
Um, right. So God, God knows what he's doing. And sometimes his way doesn't make sense in the moment, but long-term it always does, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. I would say, I don't think his decisions ever make sense in the moment. <laughs> um, I think they're always that, like, I think that's part of the faith piece is that, you know, that there's a greater plan for it, but the practicality of it, like when you were, when you look at it from the world's view, it's like the worst decision ever or the craziest decision ever. And so really having to keep that eternal perspective is it's tough. And I think sometimes he gives us those challenges over and over, especially when we start to kind of veer off course and get, you know, uh, influenced by the world that he brings us back and it's like, okay, which one are we going to follow the world or me? Like, let's, let's pull it back a little bit. (laughs) Realignment is necessary. Yeah. Uh, One of the things that you shared about, uh, and this, this came to mind as you were talking about your transition, how you really had to, I think the way you said it is like really pray through this and make sure that this was God's plan Mm -hmm. Uh, because it was a big decision, both in a financial sense, but like you said, when you probably had this reaction from your coworkers, like you're doing what? I mean, I had it uh, when I left oh, yeah. my job. Uh, I used to work as an aircraft mechanic at American. Mm-hmm. And when I left, there were several people that came to me and we had this option at American back then. You could take a leave of absence from six months to a year. Mm-hmm. So that means you could leave and come back and you wouldn't lose any, you wouldn't gain any time as far as your seniority, but you wouldn't lose yeah. your spot, so to speak. And you can just come back and say, oh, change my mind. I want to be back. And they could take you, they would take you. And I had several people say to me, why are you doing this? Why don't you at least take a leave of absence to make sure this is the right thing? Because, yeah. you know, most of us, when we're in that kind of job, it's a professional job, it takes time, it takes, you know, you have to have certain certification. Mm-hmm. So you put so much to get there. And from the world's perspective, it's like, you could be making a mistake here. Why don't you put a safety net under you? Like mm-hmm. you said. And I, like you, felt like if I were to do that, that it would be disobedient. It, it would be like, I kind of trust you, but not fully. So right. I'm going to have a backup plan. And I just couldn't do it. So my response to everyone that came up to me and asked that question, I said, look, God has been so clearly over the last four years, got me to this place that for me to say, I will, but it's disobedience and I can't do that. Right. I'm either going to sink or fail, but I'm going to trust him. And mm-hmm. I share that with everyone that's listening because it's so important to understand when God's calling you to something like this, we don't want to over emotionalize it or spiritualize it. We definitely want to hear from the Lord, but it's going to be a hard decision. It's going to be a leap. And that leap is going to be on unsolid ground. You're not, not going to land somewhere solid. It's going to feel very weird. And I remember even the first year of being on staff at a church, many times I felt like, why am I here? Like, why am I around these people? They are so much better than me. They're so much more spiritual than me. I have no qualifications to be in this place. Yeah, and that's natural. We need to understand that that's natural. Uh, so I want to encourage those that are listening. And I so appreciate you, Amber, bringing this up because we all feel that way. But God asks us to take a step and he always equips the call, not the other yeah. way around. Right. He will be there to walk you uh, every step of the way, grow you, uh, continue to test you so that you can be refined and be useful for what he's calling you to do. And it's going to be a hard journey sometimes, but also extremely rewarding journey. So thank you for sharing that. That's such a that's an amazing testimony. Um, tell me, what is the most challenging part of now serving in the ministry, especially now that you're full time and have competing um, challenges, right? <laughs> you, you, you're an operations pastor, which I'm sure has a lot of responsibilities. Plus, of course, you're the kingdom living director. So tell me about that and, and what's the most challenging part? Yeah, so I would say the most challenging part leading a ministry in a small to medium sized church is that you, you rarely have one hat, you wear multiple hats. So even prior to coming on staff, my husband and I had served in leadership positions within the church and volunteer roles for about 11 years. And each time, I mean, each time you kind of take that next step of obedience and you say yes to the next thing, the, the smaller things don't always fall off. They just get added to the things you're doing. So, you know, you agree to be a small group leader. You agree to start helping with classes. Is you you kind of take on new ministries and you're still doing all those other things as well. And so I think the most challenging part would be the multiple hats you wear because like this kingdom living ministry, this was birthed out of my husband and I just having a passion for it. And so in the very beginning of starting a ministry, you feel like if I don't keep this going, it will die. 
it will go away. No one else will take up the cause. Mm -hmm. And so it can feel very heavy and burdensome when you feel like you're trying to do that and you're trying to make sure it's growing and you're reaching enough people and you're providing um, new classes and new opportunities and figuring out what your church needs and providing the answers. But you're also doing all the other things as well. Um, And especially in a volunteer role, because in a volunteer role, it means you probably have a full-time job doing something else. And you, uh, you know, most of us are, um, have some responsibilities within our family. So if you have kids, if you're, you know, if you have uh, older parents and you're taking care of them, you're doing all of these things while also trying to create a ministry and try to, um, you know, get people to get excited about it and to do all the things all the time. And so it can, it can feel very overwhelming and it can feel very burdensome that you're not very similar to what you were saying about just feeling like, I'm not, I'm not good enough. I'm not a good enough Christian. You know, I, I constantly have like, especially coming on staff, have this feeling of, when they figure out who I really am, they will, (laughs) I will be gone. Like I will lose my job. They will stop listening to me because when they really figure out who I am, they're like, I'm not the person they think I am because there's no way they would have offered this job to me if they did, if they knew who I really was. (laughs) Right. Yeah, exactly. And so I think it can feel very overwhelming, um, trying to do all the things because you want to grow the ministry. You don't want it to become stagnant. You want to be able to provide opportunities, but really having to, um, in a small to medium church, when you wear so many hats. I think it's really important to uh, make sure that you're taking time to lean in and figure out what it is God wants you to do with the ministry. Because I mean, stewardship, it, it every God owns everything, which for someone like me, who's a type A, likes to control, likes to plan, I have to remind myself that God also owns the ministry, that it's not my ministry, it's his ministry. And it's only grown, it's only been created because he wanted it to be there. And so if he wants it to grow, it will grow. And if he wants it to slow down for a time, and then there's a gift of limits, and he slows it down. And that as long as I'm leaning in and understanding what God is asking of me and making sure I'm not taking on the, uh, when I start to feel that burden and that overwhelming, it usually means it's because I'm controlling it and I'm taking on the ownership of it versus letting it go and saying, okay, God, I've done everything you've asked me and wherever it goes now is up to you. So I think when you're, when you work for a sm- or small or when you're part of a smaller medium church, sometimes even the burden we take on that where we were never meant to take on, but we just as humans tend to control and pull in, um, it can, it can feel very overwhelming and it can be hard when you're trying to balance everything. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's gold. That's gold right there because it's so true. And it's something after we have to remind ourselves, God calls us to something that he's doing. He's not calling us to do something. Yeah. He's doing it. We just get the help of him. And when we get that mixed up or upside down, yeah, I think the the telltale sign is we lose our peace. We're frantic mm-hmm. about trying to make things happen. And usually they don't work really well when it's right. Hour, exactly. So, <laughs> so so in regards to that, um, in regards to the ministry, especially the, the kingdom living ministry, wh- what are you focused on right now? What are you working on? Yeah. So I think um, in the, the kingdom living ministry right now, um, Any type of stewardship ministry is the ministry that the people need the most and seek the least. Mm. Um, And I think that's the the challenge of any ministry or any stewardship ministry is that once you understand it as a leader and you catch that fire for it, you don't understand why other people don't get it. And you have this like burden to make sure everybody gets it because you understand the freedom that comes with it. And all you want to do is make sure everybody else catches it as well. So for us, I think what we're focused on right now is how do we get people to understand stewardship? How do we get them to apply it? And how do we get them to live it? When right now we have, we have a class and we have coaching, but you have classes and coaching no one signs up for um, because you have one set of people who you want to bang your head against the wall because they, they come up to you, they ask for prayer, they ask for counsel, and it has things to do with their finances and their relationships and their careers, which you know is all just stewardship. And you have this tool that you want to give them. It's like the key that will unlock the chain. And yet they just want the prayer because they want the genie in a bottle, like God, just make it go away and fix it. Where you know that God wants transformation. And in order to get transformation, 
transformation, he needs growth and challenges and he needs us to learn. So you've got that group of people that you just want to like shake and be like, you don't get it. Like, this is the answer to what you're looking for. And then we've got this other group of people right now who are like, no, I'm tithing. I get it. I don't need your class because I've already, I've mastered that one. Check the box. I'm tithing. I get it. And I think that's the, the other piece of it that we're trying to figure out is for these people who think that tithing is the finish line, how do we get them to understand that that's just the beginning and there's so much more that God has for them? And so we're trying to be creative. I mean, we have a class on coaching, but this last May, we offered the class and we had two people sign up. So people aren't coming, you know, they're not coming. And we have this coaching opportunity that people can do, but when they realize they have to like actually look through their budget and come up with all these numbers, they no longer want the help. And so having to figure out how we can be creative in helping people now, like in a small to medium church, it's the, one of the positive pieces of that is, is you can have a lot of influence and you can influence a lot of things. So because stewardship is all encompassing, it means it can touch every ministry. So mm-hmm. I, um, my husband and I both have influence with the lead pastors to talk about when they're planning for their annual sermons, like the sermon series, what are we talking about? Yes, we talked about stewardship last year, but like you you want to talk about it again and let's just put a new coat of paint on it, but it's still the same thing when you boil it down, but you've got to keep it interesting and pretty and sexy for everybody. And so helping influence that way, we also have influence in the giving moments. And so in those moments in our church where we have the giving moment, how do we use those 30 seconds to try to um, make sure that we're not just talking about tithing. We're not just talking about giving. We don't make people think where we want their money, but we want them to know that there's more for them. And how do we drip on them week after week in those moments? And then for us, because we have an influence in the small group curriculum that we're doing, we're able to put it in there. So we may have people who don't sign up for a class, but I can take part of my class and I can put it into the content of the small group. So you may not be willing to sign up and come to the class, but you're in a small group. And so we will drip on it there as well. Um, And so I think we've been able to find different creative ways to, to talk about stewardship and in so many different ways that it becomes that we normalize the topic and that it's not just a class or a coaching session that's going to give them the opportunity to talk about it. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I love the way you're thinking about it. And I love the phrase you said that, you know, it's the most needed ministry, but the least sought after, <laughs> right? right? People need it, but they don't seek it. But what I, you know, what I love about the way God works is that stewardship is so ingrained into everything that we do that at some point in our lives, not everything's perfect, right? We might have 95% of our life going well, and then there's that 5% that's going to bring us to our knees. And God will use that. So I want to speak that to the leaders that are listening to this. If you're a stewardship leader, realize that God gives you opportunities. And we have to think about our expression. And everything you said about whether it's the class you're doing, the one-on-one coaching, the sermon series, those are opportunities for God to speak to those people, to those specific issues that they're having, right? Because they're praying, God, help us with this, help us with that. They come for the prayer, asking for the financial breakthrough, but they're not willing to do anything. And this is God's way. So I kind of look at the way we do ministry should always be giving God more opportunities to speak Mm -hmm. to those issues, right? right. And he's creative. He can say things that we're not saying. We may be saying one thing and it somehow hits them exactly (laughs) where it needs to hit them. And that brings them into that awareness. It's like, yep. God's been telling me this. I need to do something uh, differently. And so that's when they come. So, uh, mm-hmm. but I just want to encourage you and encourage everyone out there. Uh, there's been classes that I've done where no one showed up. Yep. And I've taught a full three big class to one person. So you serve whoever's in front of you, but know that your faithfulness does not diminish no matter how many people are listening. And God can always use that. So Amber, what concerns you the most when you think about stewardship, not just in your church, but maybe even holistically, Uh, What Mm -hmm. concerns you the most and what are you excited about the most about ministry around the stewardship? Yeah, so I think um, what concerns me the most is coming out of COVID, like it's just such a different world and a different mentality that people are, are coming out of this with. And so I think the biggest concern, you know, across the board and also within our church is this apathy towards the church and towards living biblically. There's this kind of like, 
it's not a all for it and it's not an against it. It's just a ah, take it or leave it. You know, I, I don't really need it. Don't know if I, you know, there's, there's just kind of this apathy right now. Mm -hmm. And, um, with COVID, we've seen people when they're, they're that were coming out of COVID, we have seen a lot of people basically like circle the wagons and turn inward. And while COVID gave us this opportunity to reprioritize how we're living our life, how are we spending our time? You know, are we doing the things we really want to do and the things we think are important, which was an awesome opportunity to like self introspect and see. At the same time, I think people have kind of gone, the pendulum has swung too far. And now it's this idea that all I'm worried about is me and mine. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to turn inward. We're going to make sure we're just thinking about ourselves, that ourselves are taken care of and everyone else can fend for themselves. And I think that's where the, some of this apathy has come from in the church of, you know, if I attend or I don't attend, I don't really care because I don't see it as a necessity. I don't see it as a priority for me. And one of the things we're seeing too, specifically in our church, some of the, the hard conversations we've had to have recently are people who their apathy is basically, well, God and I are good. And so I don't need the church. And also I understand you're telling me that what I'm doing is a sin, but in my mind, I've talked to God about it and God's okay with it. So we're okay. And as a leader, you're just like, so God is going against his word, apparently, <laughs> just for you. <laughs> and you two are okay with it. And so it, it's definitely something that's concerning because instead of living this life of stewardship, that because Jesus is my Lord, he's the Lord of everything of mine. He's uh, mm -hmm. the Lord of my, my decisions. He's the Lord of everything. We're now kind of like, well, I said a prayer and I'm saved. So I've checked that box. So now I'm going to live my life and do my things. And I don't really need anything else. So I think that's the concerning piece. But on the flip side of that, what we've seen coming out of COVID as well is that we may not have people signing up for classes. So we offer a class, people don't come because they don't really care. They're, they don't see the need for it. It doesn't hit the priority meter for them. What we have found is that people are craving relationships and they're craving authentic, genuine conversation. They're craving realness and they don't want somebody up on a stage. They don't want a celebrity figure. Like they want someone who they feel is just like them, who is living life and um, can speak into them. And so what COVID has done, well, we don't have anybody, you know, this past year signing up for a class. My husband and I have had countless coffees and dinners and lunches with people one-on-one -on -one where they may not be willing to sign up for a class, but they are immediately responding to a text and they're saying, yes, let's have coffee. Let's talk. Let's get yep. together. And we're finding this really cool opportunity that we would have never had before in a large 40 person class setting where we get to actually talk one-on-one -on -one with someone and we get to know exactly where they're at and what their heart is, and then boldly use God's word to speak life into their situation and to, to challenge them that God has something more for them and something better for them. And we're getting to do it in this one-on-one -on -one scenario that wouldn't have happened before, but because we're doing it this way, they're also, their guard's not up. They don't have those walls up that they may have at a class. They're not waiting for the ask for the money at the end. They're not waiting for, you know, the challenge or the, the accountability. They're literally just there to get to know someone and get to uh, build a relationship with them. And we get the opportunity to sprinkle in that stewardship into the exact things they're struggling with. That's great. I, I love that, you know, both the positive and negative. And I, I think you hit it right on what I love about what you just shared about people's desire to have relationship and to connect that way is that that is a great way to build trust, mm -hmm. right? Because you're really spending the time to get to know them, so into them. And as you build that trust, then when the time comes, and it will, uh, you know, life isn't easy. So when the time comes, you'll come to mind. Like who would right. help us in this situation? <laughs> Stephen and Amber probably can help us in this situation or at least speak into it because um, we trust them. They're, they're, they mm -hmm. care about us. So I think we have to take what God gives us. And um, stewardship is never easy. Trying to walk somebody through the process of one, embracing the principles and then beginning to live those out. There's plenty of opportunities for people to drop out of the race. Yeah. And if we get 40 people in the room and teach them everything we know, but their hearts aren't ready, that's not going to go anywhere. But yet if we spend a couple of you know, three conversations, four conversations, having dinner, having coffee, and you build that relationship. Then when you do finally get them in that setting, they're going to be like, 
yep, it's time. I'm ready. Let's do this. Right. And yeah. it's, a, it's life changing, just like it was for us. So good for you guys for seeing that and taking advantage of that. That's a great input to help us right now, post pandemic, to do away with the apathy. Because like you mm-hmm. said, I think people are getting to that place where they really just don't want to live a less than stellar life, whatever that is, right? For whether it's job direction, your relationships, people have gotten to the point where they're questioning everything. And that's not a bad thing. But what you address as far as the negative is this idea that your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. That doesn't line up with God's word. And certainly yeah. as in the stewardship concept, we can embrace <laughs> Right, exactly. Um, there's only one way. I'm sorry, but that's it. Um, and believe me, it's the way you want to go. Not Don't choose your own way because you're going to pay the price in the end. Yep. Well, Amber, as we kind of wrap this up, what would be your best advice to a stewardship leader or champion, somebody that's either working in the ministry or somebody that's called to this ministry, and maybe they're already starting to dabble a little bit into it. How would you encourage them today? Uh, Yeah. So I would say absolutely get connected. Uh, And this is, you know, we haven't even talked about this beforehand, but shameless plug. I mean, CSN has changed my life and my husband's life. I would absolutely encourage them to um, become part of the network. Uh, Attending the forum every year, it's not only affected just how we think about ministry and that, but like it's changed my personal outlook on stewardship as well as like my relationship with God. And it's affected our marriage. It's affected our parenting. It's all for the better. Like it has completely changed who we are in going to even the stewardship impact workshop. I've gone to that three years in a row and the content hasn't changed, But to be around people who are like-minded, who have the same passion, who get it, because sometimes in stewardship ministry, it feels like you're the only one beating the drum. It feels Mm -hmm. like you're the only one who gets it and either they get it and it's not a priority or there's just, you feel like you're the only one who's speaking that language. And so when you get to be around these like-minded people, it really encourages you and refreshes you that you're not the crazy one, that there are others who understand it. But at the same time, it also challenges you too. There's something about, you know, being from a small to a medium church, it can feel even more lonely because you look at these resources that big churches have and the money and even like you you get to come on in a leadership role or a, a well, they're, whether volunteer or paid, and it's just one title and that's all you focus on. Um, it can feel like it would be easier if you were in a larger church. But the thing about CSN that I have found is that um, regardless of the size of your church, when we sit down and we talk about um, what we're struggling with and what we're working through and what we're trying to figure out, you find that the person next to you who's part of the mega church, who it's awe-inspiring just to see them because they're on TV and you know these names and they're like the fa- the Christian famous, like, you know, you get to sit right next to them and they're telling you they have the exact same problem you have. And that regardless of the church size, regardless of the resources, the things we struggle with, the things we're trying to figure out really have the same core. And so being part of uh, CSN has been incredible, not just personally, but in our ministry, um, our entire ministry, we didn't reinvent the wheel. Like our, the kingdom living came from all of these stewardship leaders who were at CSN who said, hey, I have a resource here and I have a resource here. And my first thought was, okay, how much, how much, you know, what do I have to pay for that? And they're like, no, 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 no. Like, we're going to send you everything for free. And then we're going to walk you through it. And, um, you know, like, where do you get to go to a conference and talk to somebody who's been doing it forever? And then them literally pick up the phone and call you personally and provide you direction and encouragement. So Mm -hmm. I would say CSN without a doubt is where you have to be plugged in. I mean, there are so many resources that are constantly coming out so many capabilities. And I mean, even Leo, when we first started, I think I had a question and I had emailed you and it was like within 10 minutes, I had a response. And, you know, me as like beginning in this whole ministry, I felt like, who am I that I can reach out to these big names and them know me by name and want to um, help me. And I think CSN is great because every person at CSN understands that a win in your ministry is a win for the kingdom. And so it's not your ministry versus mine. It's not, how do I make a buck off you? It's not, how do I copyright this? But it's, how do we encourage each other and build each other up? Because again, at the end, a win is a win because it's a win for the kingdom. Um, And so I would just encourage anybody out there who is, you know, in this ministry or starting in this ministry, it's tough. 
I'll never forget at one of the conferences, uh, they said, if you want to know what spiritual warfare is like, become a stewardship ministry leader or be in stewardship ministry. And I remember hearing that and being like, oh, oh, and it's true. But I think it's true because God has such a heart for it. And it's, there's so much freedom behind it that the enemy knows that if we can unlock that, he's lost. And so I think he knows that and not to scare anyone, but almost to normalize. Like if you feel you're hitting roadblocks, that's probably because you are. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why you need to be connected because when you hit that roadblock, you now have these godly men and women that you can reach out to, to say, Hey, this is what I'm hitting, whether personally or in ministry, I don't know what to do. And they'll tell you these amazing stories where they'll say, guess what? I had the same thing happen and they'll normalize it. And then they'll encourage you and they'll be praying for you. And so you have this group of people who is ready to protect you and, and, you know, and cover you in prayer and encourage you and equip you. So you don't feel like you're doing it by yourself, because just like you said, Leo, it's not something we're called to do. It's something God has allowed us, given us the opportunity to come alongside him and be a part of, and you can't do that alone. And CSN is the most invaluable resource because it is full of all these people who literally just love you and your ministry and they want to help. So getting connected um, with CSN is the number one thing I would, I would recommend over and over again. I can't speak highly enough about CSN. Well, thank you, Amber. And, and folks, I did not, I did not coach her and say any of I that. know, I, I promise. I don't, I didn't get paid, paid for that. <laughs> um, but I feel the same way about CSN. You know, I was a, I was a CSN member before I was, you know, in this role. And in the same way, CSN was a lifeline. And I think somebody said it at this last year's forum. He said that when they came and started to have conversation with everybody and they said, I finally found my tribe. Like I found people who get me. (laughs) And it's so true because we are so uniquely gifted and so misunderstood because most of the time stewardship is still misunderstood and misinterpreted or um, misdefined in the church. And so people don't really know what we're all about. You know, they, yeah. they might think we're like Dave Ramsey, you know, disciples. I don't know. Yep. It, yeah, exactly. Everybody has their own perspective, but when you come and be part of this network of, of leaders, uh, it really helps you to understand that you're not alone. And, and this calling is very unique. And I think it's very timely for our generation. Um, money, wealth is more deceiving today than ever before and more center stage in our lives. So it's important that we, we take that step. So thank you so much, Amber, for First of all, just for uh, all of your words of wisdom, and I'm, I apologize if you guys can hear that. I got a chainsaw going out outside my window <laughs> for some reason. Um, so we'll, we'll just roll with it because uh, that's what we got to do. We're, we're stewards. We'll, we'll manage what we have, right? But I just want to thank you for taking the time. I know that it's time away from what you're doing, which is important, and, and I appreciate you just sharing with all of our folks that are listening to this podcast that what you said really, I believe, will encourage them no matter where they are in the ministry. And you've had some great insights. So I so appreciate your time and I appreciate you. Uh, I just love that three years after you started with CSN or four years, whatever it's been, that you've had such an amazing uh, benefit from it. And that's why we exist. So we're, that's such a such an encouragement to me and to the folks that uh, that are leading this organization. Thank you for that. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. This is an incredible opportunity. And I mean, honestly, I was, uh, you know, humbled and honored that you guys would even ask. I think sometimes we can feel just like, who are we, you know? (laughs) So um, I appreciate it. And I, and, and thank you to CSN and to all the leaders because they have had such an incredible um, impact uh, on, on our lives. And so we can't, I mean, can't thank you guys enough. Oh, it's it's our pleasure. And you are by default giving back. And I appreciate that. Well, for those of you that have listened to the podcast, I hope it's really blessed you. I hope that you got a bunch of good stuff out of this because I think everything that Amber shared, her own personal journey into this ministry, the challenges, the benefits that are coming from her serving in this ministry, I think they're universal to all of us that are in this ministry, called to this ministry. So I hope that you were encouraged by this. So if you listen to this, I hope you'll share it with someone else. Share it with someone that either a volunteer that you feel is passionate and faithful because God may be tapping them on their shoulder to become more involved in this ministry. And we'd love to see more people involved in stewardship ministry. We feel like it is uh, what God is doing and we want to be about his work. So he's called us to it. We want to impart that to more and more people so that God can bring them into, into this fold. And uh, if you want to know more about CSN, we'd love to serve you. We are at christianstewardshipnetwork.com. You can find us on the website. 
We also have the Stewardship Impact Workshop, which Amber uh, mentioned several times. And this is a one-day workshop. We also have it in a online course form uh, that will really bless you. It will set a foundation for what stewardship really is, the theology of giving and generosity, and of course, stewardship is all in there. And it's just great content that will really help you build a solid foundation of stewardship so that as you launch a business, you'll know kind of the basis of where to start from. And I think it's really, really an impactful uh, course or workshop if you want to attend it in person. And also, we are about to launch or have just launched, depending on when this airs, our Christian Stewardship Network membership. So you'll be able to find that at membership.christianstewardshipnetwork.com. We've been working on this, folks, for years, and we finally have it. And I'm so excited because this will be the place where all of us can be together all year long, not just at the forum. Uh, so I really encourage you to check that out. Uh, this will be a membership that will allow you to really have a ton of resources as soon as you sign up. And then we will continue to have member-based type events and coaching calls and monthly gatherings so that we can grow together. I'm so excited about this. I think you'll love it. I think you'll uh, really benefit from it. And we'd love to see more churches connected to it. So let others know about it, membership.christianstewardshipnetwork.com. Well, again, thanks for joining us today. I hope you enjoy this episode and we'll see you next time on Stewardship Leader. <music>